And because I there believe in the reliability of recording to the computer, I'm going to do that and share once again. Yep, it's actually four, uh, four meetups, uh, Portland, San Francisco Bay Area, and two new meetups uh, courtesy of Alicia, uh, Alicia Rock uh, Quorum, a virtual meetup for the Western US and one for the Eastern US. Uh, I, I thank all the organizers and everybody from all the meetups for joining us. And this, I think this is like the fifth time we've done a proposal prep meetup for Portland and they pushed me to put, to bring it to, bring it to a wider audience, and I, I'm glad for that. And once again, for the picture uh, of the conference in 2019, and I say I hope because we haven't made anything official that we'll have a live in-person conference in 2022, but I'm confident and, and hopeful that we'll see each other again then in person. Of course, we'll see each other virtually. Uh, just the basics. Uh, the deadline for proposals is the 25th of January. That's Monday night Pacific time, midnight. And a little bit on the process. All the proposals go through before a committee of several people who've been part of the Write the Docs community. Uh, I'll show you a link to an example proposal with some of the highlights that we're looking for. And we have five people who volunteer to present or talk about their proposal, or is it, is it six now? Uh, if you want, want to join, join the list, uh, uh, DM me in the, in the chat and hopefully I'll, uh, I'll see it. Uh, but with, with with five or six, we, we have a pretty full deck. And just basically, uh, I'll give you five minutes to talk about your proposal, and then we'll go do question and answer and or discussion for another five minutes each. In the past, for past Portland conferences, at least, we've typically had over 100 proposals each. And, and that makes uh, life difficult for a proposal committee who, who has to uh, screen that out, review each proposal, and bring that down to, I forget, oh, well, actually, it varies by conference. Sometimes it's 15, sometimes it's 17 speakers. How many proposals are we going to get for a virtual conference? I don't know if people are still experimenting with that. But for a proposal committee, it's like getting a ream of resumes, or I think the right analogy is more like college admissions committees, people who have to review all applications or all proposals. So what, what do you need? What do you need to do with a proposal? What you, there are so many, you've got to find a way to grab our attention. Uh, we've included a good amount of guidance in an example proposal, and I include the URL here. Uh, but just quickly, we have some highlights. Uh, we do look for catchy titles. We want something to catch the eye, not only of us, but of the attendee. Will they go to, go to and visit your talk and lis uh, listen in, or will they go to a non-conference session? Uh, we, we've seen many proposals that look like walls of text that make the old Windows blue screen of death look succinct. So keep your stories brief. I mean, I, I think proposals as another version of UI text. And you want lessons for your audience. Something an audience and the proposal committee can set up as a checklist. I mean, when people attend conferences, they spend money to attend conferences. They're expected to give reports. They want to be able to tell their bosses, well, at talk, at talk by this great person, I learned A, B, and C, and here are the lessons we can apply to, uh, to our work. Uh, for, and when you have lessons, you have spoilers. You want to give people a taste of what they're going to learn. 
and just in general, we want to avoid talks on specific tools. Yes, some people are interested in the latest version of Markdown, but I forget how many versions of Markdown there are. So I guess I, to repeat myself a little bit, here's the format I have in mind. And given that this is Zoom, if you have slides, you should be able to screen share them with us. And once you go over your proposal, we'll, uh, some of us will have questions or ideas for, to help you improve what you have in mind. And with that, I'm going to present the first proposal uh, because the person is uh, unable to attend. They're in a time zone where it's, uh, I think it's two in the morning for them. Uh, the proposer is Laura Novich, and she is, has a proposal going on community documentation. Uh, her, ca her catch, uh, her hook is to make a story, a, a talk that makes analogies to Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. And I hope you all can see this proposal and, and read it. It's, a, it's probably a little small, but I'll describe some highlights as you look over it and then I'll open the floor for questions. Uh, since this is recorded, I hope, hope to be able to share this with Laura for feedback. Laura has experience with open source documentation communities and full disclosure, we've worked together, not in the same company, but she actually teaches a technical writing course and she set up a bunch of students to edit some of our documentation. Specifically, they, they took Veil, which is a grammar linter, found errors in her documentation and use Git tools, learning them for the first time to fix errors in her documentation. Uh, Laura goes further, and uh, I don't personally know of her experience with documentation communities, but evidently she has some and wants to make, make analogies to Willy Wonka. And, and how different characters in Willy Wonka can can serve as lessons for creating excellent documentation communities. And with that in mind, I'm going to see what you, what, what you all think and that I'll open, open this up for discussion and uh, ideas. How, how can this proposal be improved? The first thing I have in mind is, well, I mean, Willy Wonka is a pretty old story and I'm not sure that, uh, that, that it, the whole audience knows uh, knows about the, about the story, so maybe that can be clarified. And if you all have other ideas, uh, please uh, unmute yourself and speak up. I have a question. Uh huh. Um, my question is, um, I'm not sure is the is is the presenter intending to be addressing, let's say, a, a docs team who are is considering opening their documentation to public contribution? Uh, the assumption is that, that, that it is, and there's a, a, there's a good portion of the Write the Docs community that is open source and already has their documentation available for contributions. The right. question okay. is how do you build on that? Oh, okay, so it's, it's not about whether to, to just, how to decide whether to open or not. It's about once you're, your docs are open, uh, how to like, how to handle the contributions, how to moderate, so to speak? Yes, how okay. to moderate, how to encourage people to, to, to make their contributions and continue making contributions. One of the big problems with open source communities is that almost everyone's a volunteer. They're not paid. Right. How do you say, hey, you're doing a good job and encouraging them encourage them to make more contributions. Okay. All I would ask for then is a little a little extra piece of context setting before diving in to say like this assumes that your docs are already open. Now let's talk about how to handle your community. 
Excellent feedback. Because to me, I was like, I don't know what I, I was missing that piece of context. That's all. No, thank you. Please, uh, I, I please can I follow up on that? Because it sounds as though you're like, if I read that first question, mm -hmm. um, that that's really kind of where you're coming from, right? And it might be like, it's not clear to me which the answer is. Are you contemplating opening or are you already there? Right? Good question, so Jennifer. It, yes. Maybe even sort of, I mean, I mean, I'm taking Liz's question and building on it, right? Yes, um, I hear you. It, sort of context framing, you know, as broadly as possible and then narrowing down to the specifics. Well, I, I actually want to add to that also, you know, because the title, I really like to have titles um, really describe what, what problem you're addressing in whatever you're presenting or, you know, if you're writing. And so to me, it looks like documentation community is golden ticket or bad nut. It's like, I'm assuming she's say, saying, oh, you're trying to decide whether you want to build a documentation community. So, you know, it really, it, it like, it, and then um, she seems to, to be saying, well, here are tips, best practices, examples, and anecdotes. But that's like, you've already decided to build a documentation community and here, here's how, here's what you should watch for. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm back in, it, I'm back it, with the title. And it's like, um, you know, in my own position, you know, I, I, I might actually, you know, be inviting people to help with documentation because there's some things open source that I'm, I'm working on. And so I want to know how to make those decisions. You know, it's like, I want, I want here to backpedal. Anyway, I hope I'm not going on too long. <laughs> no, this is great. Abig, you're, you're telling me that the title doesn't really express what the, what the talk is about. And, and that goes along with some, some of the other feedback that says, is it really a decision on, on going open source or not? Or, or what, how, do you, how do you express that more clearly? Mike, I have one more thing to add kind of in this thread that we're going through is that mm -hmm. I feel like there's open source that's like completely open source, like the view JS docs where yes nobody really owns them per se it's all volunteers and then there's like a company that has some open source tool that they make available and so people can add prs to the code and or documentation and they're kind of two different things and so i think if she could clarify which she's talking about and if she's experienced with both if there's like things that she's wrestling with that could be different for either one i, I think it could be interesting <clears throat> Well, you have a sense. you have a secondary interesting take, which is uh, at a previous company that I was at, that was a large company. We tried to help the customer success become a documentation community because they wanted to contribute to those types of documents, and so that would be another type of documentation community. And I think that this is intentionally a little bit vague, and. I think it's because it becomes more encompassing of where you are. It could be that you are in an open source community and you're trying to help people contribute to the documentation aspect. It could be that you are in a large company and you're trying to align your company to be a part of the documentation community. It could be that you're open sourcing one aspect, um, really anything along those lines. And I think that's probably why it is framed more generically. Um, because, because all of this requires management and it's all very sticky because you have to set a standard and you know it's you enforce that differently depending on if somebody is an employee versus if somebody is contributing it in open source uh, but regardless you still need documentation and from the open source perspective the major decision factor for a lot of people using open source is the documentation. Mm -hmm. And their tertiary thought about it is documentation hasn't been highlighted in open source, um, always the same way that development is. And so 
you know, there are places that are trying to highlight docs in accompaniment to open source projects as complementary, like Google Season of Docs, Good Doc Project, etc. Like they all have encouragement and programs to how do you get people just to come on and contribute to docs? Because most people don't have a problem getting folks to submit a PR for code. It's much harder to get people to actually write down what they've just created. Absolutely. These are great points. It does also mention teams inside and outside your organization in the top bullet. It does. There it is. We missed it. <laughs> It does, but uh, Abby, that points to the difficulties of uh, uh, of reviewing talks. You're reviewing this talk uh, uh, on the fly, and the comments are great, but sometimes the info is there. So, I, I have one more thing um, to to add in in this is that this is such a broad topic that I think you know, like, what would interest me, and what it seems like might interest other people that have spoken up is the second bullet point procedures for recruiting new writers and bringing them up to speed. Yep. And, yep. and see, this is like so broad. I don't see if it's a half hour. I don't see how she can cover everything here. Great. So like the one bullet point that I think we all would agree if we're if we're, you know, interested in documentation communities for open source is how to recruit new writers and bring them up to speed. On the same note, most of these dovetail into each other because you would need to give an example of how you make re reviews feel welcome to contributors and contributors are folks who have once been new writers. And so, um, and I, I think a lot of these things can be touched on in maybe one to two slides max. Um, I think there's definitely probably like three top things, which would be procedures for recruiting, converting naysayers, and aligning the entire organization. Like three is generally your golden number. You can push five in a lot of cases, but I think you're right that there is too many. But I, I think she, it sounds as though to me, she is writing out you know, the kind of the example that goes along with the main point without highlighting the main point. And I think highlighting the main point is probably what comes next is how do we focus into that? Because we know we're going to get examples. Like if you're recruiting for a new writer, you're going to have to onboard them to methods and tools. And you're going to have to give them good feedback uh, to help them want to engage with the community. So like those would be two bullet points within that new writing thing. Could I add something here? Sure, Mom. Um, um, I see those those multiple bullet points could also be viewed as some could be um, process oriented, some could be culture specific. Like culture specific example would be um, converting naysayers into cheerleaders. Mm -hmm. and aligning an entire organization to think about and contribute to the documentation that could be seen as ways to um, contribute to the documentation community culture whereas the first of all point to methods and tools for collaboration and motivation with teams inside and outside your organization i'm sorry that should probably go under the culture as well but um so i see several things in there that um, belong under okay this is culture specific and then there are other things that are uh, that could probably be combined into higher yep. topic bullet points. Okay, to get to the magic three, uh, I, I hate to cut the cut off conversation, but we do have five or six people to what to, uh, who, who want to talk about the proposals. So I'm going to cut this off and go to proposal two. And I see Brian Kerr, who is, uh, who is set up for proposal two, was available. Uh, Brian, if you want to take the ball, great. I don't know if you have, but have information that you can screen share or, or want to share or want to do things uh, verbally. Uh, 
I'll leave that up to you. Um, I, I don't have anything kind of screen share ready, but I was just going to kind of go over kind of my talk proposal idea and uh, kind of just get feedback and see what everyone thinks. Um, as a list here, my proposed talk idea is lift off how to make sure your documentation is ready for your next launch. Question is, I don't know if that's too wordy or not. <laughs> but um, to give you some background, um, I work at a company that uh, has a SaaS company that has an API driven product. And um, earlier, uh, I guess not earlier this year, but last year, we um, had a really big product release that kind of repositioned our product and what it can do and what our API is possible to do. And so that required a lot of help doc, API docs, and guide updating. And so we really had to kind of take a few steps back and figure out how we were going to work with our product team, our marketing team, and our support team to make sure that this, when this launch was successful, um, you know, it was going to be seamless and not drive up more support, or it, it was going to be something that customers could actually use. Um, and so my talk in general is going to kind of, or the proposal talk would be um, how we audited, organized, and prioritized which documentation uh, needed updating and when, uh, along with the product roadmap that was needing to be updated. So kind of, uh, we built this thing called an Omni doc. So it was going to be kind of share what that is and how we organized all that information. Um, how we worked with our marketing team to make sure that the language that we were using in our documentation was the same language they were going to be using when they launched because we wanted to make sure that, um, you know, our, our, our help docs didn't say this is what this feature is called and marketing was using different terminologies. We wanted to make sure we were on the same page there. Um, and then also how we worked with our support team uh, as we went through betas and early access periods to take the feedback that they were getting in support and put that into our, our docs as well so that I was answering uh, questions ahead of time. And then kind of finally, another really big piece is how we were working with our product team to make sure um, that, you know, as they were getting ready to launch things, we were staying up to date and kind of working in tandem. Uh, so, you know, a lot of Jira work there, that type of thing. Um, and so I think this is just really helpful for anyone that works at a SaaS company. Uh, and I guess to maybe some perspective to share as well, we are more of a self-service API. And so, you know, the, it's, our documentation is really our product, uh, alongside our product. We don't really have a lot of high touch customer experiences. So it's really important uh, to kind of continue to make these seamless, um, to create a seamless launch so that we're not driving up all these uh, uh, customer conversations that we don't really have the person power to handle. Um, so that's kind of the big abstract idea of my talk. That's fantastic, Brian. Do you have what would you say are the lessons learned that uh, that that people can get, can learn from your experience? Or uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think I think probably the biggest lesson that I learned from that was just at every point in cross team collaboration is um, and making sure that you are if it's the product team um, or marketing or support, making sure it's clear what is needed at what time and kind of you know, setting deadlines, that type of deal, so that everyone has set expectations and also knowing that you're working towards a shared goal. I think that's sometimes lost when you're working at a company where it's, you know, you're, uh, it's, the, it's the Dan Gable quote, quote, you know, you shoot, I win, I, I shoot, you win, that type of deal, where sometimes there's kind of some friction between maybe a product team or something like that, where you're saying, I need this, I need to know more about this part of how this feature is going to work so I can document it. But the understanding that like we're doing this for the better good for ourselves to make life easier down the road. Um, but that, that's a good question because I realize I probably should uh, kind of kind of narrow down on that as well. Great. Uh, open discussion. Uh, other questions? Yeah, I just want to say, Brian, you really got my interest when you mentioned aligning terminology with marketing. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> That is a huge thing for us. And I'm curious what the scale is of your team. Like, is it, and the other teams, small company scale or larger company scale or? Uh, uh, yeah, we're definitely, definitely smaller. We're about 33 people and uh, a handful of people in support and a handful of people in, in marketing. So I guess we are probably a little bit lucky in that regard. 
Um, but you know, we, we, we still are not the same people doing the same. Uh, we, you know, we still do have these separate teams, so we still do need to work between them. I think that's something you could usefully emphasize, the sort of collaborative you know, documentation as a piece of a collaborative launch readiness. I mean, that's what I heard you say initially. Mm -hmm. And it seems like it's coming up more as, as you elaborate on your ideas. And mm -hmm. there have been some really well received, um, really successful talks where folks have talked about um, cross functional collaboration. Um, so you might want to think about really sort of foregrounding that. And that's kind of a follow up to, to Tana's point, right, about sort of terminology, not just, okay, we work with marketing, you know, so we work with support, but here's exactly how we do it. And here's how it affects the documentation. And along the same lines, I, I think also totally different direction, you might need to submit two proposals. Yeah. <laughs> um, what you were sort of suggesting about um, better documentation I'm translating, right? So stop me if I got this wrong, but I thought I heard you kind of moving in the direction of, well, better documentation for our users means better documentation for our internal teams as they move forward on product development. Um, if I didn't hear you say that, <laughs> disregard. No, 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 that's a good point. Um, you know, for some of this, there were some internal documentation that I've been, I mean, now that you say that, I even just think of like, I, I was able to, like, uh, there was a new part of our API that we did, and I was able to go look at the documentation for like the raw spec that we made. So I was able to like really draw upon that to, you know, answer some questions before asking the product team things more specific. So, um, so then you have almost like a closed communication loop there, which also sounds really cool. Now you've got three talks. Yes. <laughs> so, I I would like to insert just another another thing that interested me in your description was that this is a um, self-service API and even though like your title I like your title how to make sure your documentation is ready for your next feature launch um, I would be even more drawn in um, you know if there was some way you could rewrite that because you know you're doing SaaS with you know with self-service APIs, and um, so it's really you know it's highly technical and it's for an, uh, you know it's for an audience that that is going to be relying solely on the documentation, which is different from you know what some audiences might be because sometimes uh, people are have to still have to write good docs, but they're assuming that there's a sales engineer that's assisting um, certain kinds of customers. So, um, you know, the, this is a customer base that relies solely on your documentation in most cases. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and that's going to be really, I mean, that's like so important. And, you know, so you're, you were preparing for an important launch with, you know, a lot on the line um and the way that you succeeded was through this collaborative effort and maybe you could find a way to to even though that's not bad what you have uh, you might be able to, to find a way to reword it to include a, a, a couple more things that might draw people in even more because they'll see the drama of the moment <laughs> you know i i don't know exactly how to word it but i'm just seeing the potential for really being drawn even more more yeah, into that's the, the idea yeah make it a little bit more narrow focused yeah hi uh, this is danny uh uh they, um i i'm in pause i interrupting i think you're at a, a pausing point and my proposal is similar to this topic so i'm not sure if it would make sense to to segue after uh into something because i have uh, similarly uh, amorphous um uh project status Oh, I mean, I guess I sort of promised a, a certain order. Uh, okay, then never mind. Never mind. Never mind. I, I came on late. I'm I'm happy to put you in on uh, uh, number number six. I guess I, I don't know if Rachel. Oh no, that's fine. Okay. I again, I apologize. I am on the road, and I I was unable to to make it home. So I was I was just jumping on, but I can I can just listen. Thanks. Life happens. Thank you. 
Uh, is there any more discussion on uh, on Brent's proposal? Well, uh, now that we've had enough awkward silence for the end of the discussion, Thank you all. Uh, let's go on to number three and Alicia Rock. She has an idea on how I can get started in open source as a technical writer. All right, Mike, thank you so much. Would you be willing to let me share my screen? Would oh, that absolutely. be okay? I'll stop okay. sharing and okay. we can take the A little off. bit of con, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, it looks like a disabled participant screen sharing. So if you wanna make me a co-host, that will allow Disab me to have that. Disabled participant screen sharing, gosh. Yeah, it says the host disabled it. But if you make me a co-host, I'll be able to, to Let's present. see here, how do I do that. So there's a little dot menu next to my box. You can click that and then do make co-host. Uh, if you're willing to share the power. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm I'm fine with that. I'm just, uh, the only option I have is to make host, which I'll have oh. to do. You'll just have to make me. Host okay, back, I will I share guess. it. It will transfer it back to you. <laughs> yep. Sorry about that. No problem. Okay. I promise I'll be a good steward. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm Elisa Rock. Um, I'm a technical writer for VMware, but in particular, I work on an open source project um, called SALT, which is one of the top 50 open source projects on um, GitHub. So, um, and I joined the, the technical writing subreddit a couple of months ago, and I found that, um, 50% of the questions were, how can I be, how can I break into this career? How I'm either a new graduate and I want to become a technical writer or I want to transition from a different profession into this. So that was the original context behind writing this blog post. It was because I was constantly typing out, come join open source and get some experience there. Um, and so, so it was geared towards that audience. And one of the things I'd probably like feedback on is how to expand it to a write the docs audience. But um, so I usually start out in this blog entry by just talking about what's the basic pathway to getting a job. It's not always what some people intuitively think of when it comes to getting a job. Um, I really like a really cool um, graph or diagram from What Color Is Your Parachute, where he talks about what job seekers think is the path to getting a job versus what people who are uh, prospective employers think about how they want to hire somebody for a job. And one of the things that I think are particularly interesting is item number two and three, where employers really prefer to have some sort of proof that you can do the job of some kind. And a lot of times they hire people who know somebody in the company or have some sort of connection to it. And, and the good news for prospective technical writers is open source basically takes care of those two elements in some ways. First off, by contributing to an open source community, you're developing proof that you can do technical writing. You're um, kind of developing that experience. If you're a seasoned technical writer, but you wanna break into a new area of technical writer uh, writing, or if you want to learn a new tool set that you haven't experienced with before, it will also give you experience with that because, um, it gives you a, a reason to learn those tools. So it's kind of nice that way. And the other really nice benefit that people don't always think about when it comes to contributing to open source is that it can really expand your social network. Um, through contributing to social, uh, sorry, <laughs> to open source projects like I've done, because I don't just contribute to SALT, I also contribute to a project called the Good Docs, which is for um, technical writers who want to uh, increase documentation in open source generally. Um, you can really make some good friendships and those friendships can sometimes be useful in getting a job. I've gotten a few job offers that I haven't taken, but um, through my open source connections and communities. So it's really handy that way. Um, so it, it kind of does both. And the good news about open source is that 
you can make a meaningful contribution as a technical writer, absolutely, <laughs> because there is a dearth of uh, technical writers. Um, and developers would love you to take their documentation tasks off their hands. They will, they will gladly <laughs> give you those tasks to do, and they would welcome you with open arms. And a lot of communities would just think that's the best thing ever. So it's a place where um, technical writers could really make a big difference. Um, I do include a couple of caveats in my um, in my blog post just because of the audience. I mentioned that um, experience can't always replace a college degree, and that's worth noting. Um, but it can sure go a long way. And the other thing that I like to mention is that there are inequities when it comes to open source contributing. Um, unfortunately, open source communities uh, are not as diverse or inclusive as I would like them to be. And so that's one of the things I really work on in, in my open source community work. But I just set those on the table just so people are aware of it sometimes. Um, in, my, in the last part of my um, blog entry, I usually just kind of give tips of how to choose the right project because not all communities are a good fit for you. So you have to really do some research and digging to find out if it's the right kind of fit for what you want to learn, what your interests are, what your existing skill set is. Um, so you want to kind of do some soul searching when you do that sort of thing. And then when you're preparing to give your first contribution, you really want to kind of learn more about the community that you're thinking about joining. You want to read their community docs. You want to maybe join a few working groups and see if it's the kind of place where you feel like you might fit in. Um, and check out their code of conduct. Do they have a good code of conduct? Do, does it feel like it'll be a safe and welcoming place for different people? All of those things are important to do. Um, just to make sure it's a healthy community and one where you feel like you could be at home with. Um, and then of course there's the tool set. Um, you have to have a code editor. It's really helpful to know Markdown. Most documentation in open source is written in Markdown, in my experience at least. Um, you really need to learn about Git. That's scary and it's not fun, but it's like driving a stick shift where it's really hard. It's so hard to get there, but once you do, you just feel awesome and you can do so much and it's so powerful. Does that date me to say? stick shift. I don't know. And then I just give a bunch of other um, tips about how to, you know, learn about Git and how to find the right community for you and, and things like that. So that would be basically the tenor of the talk. So um, the kind of feedback I'd love to see is how to improve the title and to make the hook a little bit better, how to um, modify the, the, this material to expand it to a write the docs audience, which maybe not everybody is looking for a new job or trying to transition into technical writing um, and any other feedback you'd like to give. I welcome that feedback. So. Gosh, I see five different, uh, six different uh, presentations in there and it looks like, it, it looks like a very impressive book, but when you present it as a proposal, you need, you need something that people or reviewers can digest quickly. And yep. People, sounds good. Maybe others can help, uh, help help Alicia with that. Can you remind us what the title was, Elisa? Yes, it was just a very basic getting started in open source as a new tech technical writer. That was all it was. So, As we're noodling on the title, um, one thing since you asked about the question for making it more uh, to the Write the Docs audience, I, th I think it could be really simple, something like, a sense like whether you're looking for your first job or your next job or just want to get more experience to make it more universal. Right, I was going to say you could take new out of the title because I would be interested. I mean, it's always good to make connections, right, especially if you're trying to move to a different role or a different company. What yeah. not? I could see that. I like that. I, re I think that's I really a really like point, but I want to follow up on it because something that occurred to me and this is probably inviting like okay talk number four here but might intersect with what you wind up actually proposing so i think you make some really good points about paying attention to the communities of the projects you're considering to contribute to but many of the open source projects that need documentation help the most don't even have those that basic structure in place. They've barely got a README. They often just fold 
some really basic contributing information into the readme. There's no code of conduct, not because the community sucks, although it might well, right? <laughs> Um, but, but let, I mean, especially on a small project that seems to be gaining momentum and to really need some documentation help, they might well not have got to it yet. I mean, that might, like, so this is riffing on the, you know, sort of new writers versus um, sort of further down the road. Like, like a lot's going to depend on your tolerance for ambiguity and confusion, a really well-established product project, you know, the Kubernetes docs would dearly love to see technical writers, but there is all the structure and community in the world anybody could possibly want um, or, you know, for a technical writer to step in there. Whereas some of the smaller projects that I've seen are just kind of limping along docs-wise could really use somebody, but you really kind of have to reinvent it from the ground up. That really is a whole other talk, but it feels like there's a piece in there that touches on what you're talking about. Um, yeah. Maybe if nothing else, then just to like, if if you're if what you want to do is address folks new to open source, um, point out that there's a huge range, right? Um, uh, there's a huge range of possibilities and then the criteria that you I think really rightly identify as things to look out for if you're looking for a first time project are things that are going to be characteristic of larger projects that are still going to need your help, right? Um, sorry, I'm kind of thinking out loud at you, but I No, those are such good points and they're really important to note. Even if I don't like make this proposal, just like adding to the blog entry or adding those kinds of caveats would be really good. Um, and to your point, that's a lot of what we're trying to do with the good docs is to improve like that base template or base documentation line in many ways. So I love it. That's great. Yeah, I, I feel bad. I was involved with that project at the very beginning and then got overloaded. Oh, that's up. right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> very good. Hey, it's all good. Hey, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but people can submit more than one idea to the proposal submission. Is that true? That's true. Uh, typically, well, we've had multiple submissions from the same people. We've never, at least to my knowledge, accepted more than one from the same person. Yes, yes, yes. And that, that I would assume, but more so, you know, we've had a lot of discussions that have kind of broken down things into more than one presentation. And yep. so if you want to do the work, totally up to you, you can submit more than one. And also remember, you don't have to have your talk fully written before you submit something. So you can just abstract away, as they say. Yeah. And one other thing, I, I just noticing in the Zoom group chat that uh, Jerome, I don't know if you want to uh, verbalize it, your suggestion, but he seems to have a great suggestion for uh, a talk title. Sure, yeah. Open source opens doors. I like it. <laughs> That's really good. Yeah, and then there was another also, one, right? Um, fits right into like what I've done. Uh, I'm a newer technical writer and I've done Google Season of Docs and I'm working with the open source gig. So this is right up my alley. Thank you. Yep, and the second so cool. suggestion from Danny. I don't know if you want to verbalize. Uh, I guess Danny's uh, not quite uh, not able to unmute. So I'll just say her, her suggestion was technically employed. There, just so you're aware. Yeah, they're, they're driving. Ah, right, okay. Not driving at the moment, but sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, they, them, and uh, it's fine. I, it was just a suggestion, so. Um, I like it, I, I like it too. Oh, thanks, that's kind. Well, that's really helpful. Thank you so much, everybody. And that seems like a natural end of discussion to what Alicia has done. And I guess I can, if I can find the Zoom controls. Uh, and I think I made you the host again. Did that work? Share my screen. It looks like okay. I'm able to do that. So I will slide off to proposal four.
uh, Kimberly Johnson. I, if you have slides, I'm happy to make you the host. Thank you so much. Um, I don't have slides, but I do have an abstract written that it might be helpful for me to just put up on the screen, if it's okay, okay for me to share my screen. Oh, absolutely. It looks like my button is illuminated. Oh, no, nope, disabled participant screen sharing. So if you wouldn't mind, yep. I will try to, to be as my good of a steward as it was. You should have access now. Okay, it looks like I have that notification. Let me go ahead and share desktop two. Let's see if it'll let me allow Zoom. Oh no, I haven't allowed Zoom to share my screen yet because I actually work at a video API company. So we build our own products. Um, experiment a lot. And let's see if this will turn on really quickly. And if not, okay, I should be good. But okay, you know what, that's not working, but I can talk through it instead. So uh, I think everyone was able to see that the idea for the talk was that talks are products too, and they should grow and evolve with your business. So to have them, as I mentioned, I work for a, a video API company. We actually pivoted to focus on software from being a hardware company in 2019. And then a year later, a lot more developers than we expected found themselves Googling how to add video to uh, my application. So that meant we had to look at revising our docs because we outgrew them a lot more quickly than we expected. Uh, specifically, our getting started guide really needed a refresh. So there's that intersection of the lots of people adopting our product unexpectedly, uh, global circumstances changing, um, leading to that. So I was thinking that was something that a lot of companies might might encounter or be dealing with, or a product fo focus at the company. Like I mentioned, we switched from software to hardware. So those were the two things I was thinking might be common challenges. So this talk, we'll talk through how we shipped a new getting started page in just a few weeks. And the three main uh, takeaways I have for now are how we mapped our customers' experiences from their first interaction to testing, to a custom integration, to inform our new information architecture for getting started. That's number one. Number two is how we leaned on our core company metrics to think of our revision as its own product, kind of like Brian was saying earlier, like the docs are a product too. And the final thing is how we identified what was important, but now kind of extraneous information and how we found that a new home that wasn't necessarily our getting started guide. That's the high level summary. And my main questions for the, or the docs community are, um, what could be add or take away that would increase your interest in a talk like that? Um, what, what do you think would make a talk like that more memorable? And when talking about these sorts of improvements in smaller companies, we're a team of uh, 10, like 10 when I joined and maybe 20, 25 now, how important are the specifics and qualitative metrics? And any other thoughts you might have, of course, welcome to. I think people are always hungry for how other people set up metrics and how to collect them. Uh, I, that that's just always a, a topic of conversation I'll I'll have in the hallway track uh, with regards to just interacting with folks casually at the event, even the the virtual hallway track that we set up using the sessions for last year. And so, like, I d I wouldn't say you need to like go into an in depth implementation of it, but like I would be prepared for at the very least a lot of follow up questions about it because that's a huge area of curiosity for a lot of people. Um, because doc metrics are different than, you know, page touches and, and the marketing funnel and, you know, how, how people interact with the product because it sits, you know, uniquely as its own product to an extent, but also as a service uh, to both folks in and outside of the company. So. Thank you. That's really helpful. Kimberly, um, I just wanted to say, I always like the, the talks that are, um, uh, like a, a case study. So as you set the context, like small company moving from hardware to software, like all of those details that you gave, like, yes, I really want to know about the metrics and I'll be listening for that. But I really like that there's a narrative there. You know, here's why we had to do this. I'm going to do it in a big fat hurry. Here's why we had to do it in a hurry. 
it's particularly impressive that you did a lot of that you paid a lot of attention to metrics when you had to do this in a hurry. So it's it basically I'm saying it's a story I'd I'd like to hear. I I agree with that. It's also um, people are gluttons for punishment, and they love to hear hear about failure and how you've like risen from the ashes to succeed, or even if you didn't succeed in the way that you thought you did, and you had to completely pivot. People love that type of like, it was so awful, it was the worst, but you know what, we figured out how to get through it because it's just, it's such a human thing and everybody fails. And so every, probably if you, if you take that slight to a degree, you're gonna have a lot of people coming up to you being like, oh man, uh, we had to do something similar and it didn't really turn out that way. So it was really encouraging to hear someone else struggle through it who figured out a way to like, turn it into some glory or or just like who got through it because it's the getting through that really appeals. But Rose wouldn't Rose wouldn't you say that it's more common to hear conference talks that are about like this really successful awesome thing we did as opposed to this crash and burn that happened? <laughs> you can, so, so here I will give you an example. Um, so my mom uh, she ended up doing an undergraduate like uh, thesis and during her thesis, she disproved her uh, her foundation, her her abstract, or whatever it's called. I'm terrible with words because it's the end of my day. Um, and everybody was like, "Oh, you know, you can take another year and you can redo all of this research, and it'll be fine. You'll find something that you quote succeed at." And she's like, "You know what? I'm done because I have helped someone else take one step further to." doing better next time. And just because like you succeeded and you were awesome, and you got all the glory the first time, like I don't actually think I've met somebody who hadn't tripped and fallen, shall we say, before like figuring out how to better succeed. Um, not that I don't like success stories, but I think it's the hubris that gets me a lot of the time. And that could just be 100% preferential. Like I will cop to that. So. Uh, I want to just way to take, I, I think the way to take Rose's point to a potentially more sort of broader reaching um, proposal or talk um, is to frame sort of frame it as failure points, right? I mean, you because if you're shipping docks at a certain point, and like the story that you just told us, you know, you've got to shipping docks, right? whether you wound up with quite the metrics that you hoped for as you were planning for them or not, that's a whole nother story. You never do actually, right? And that's, I mean, it's really interesting to talk about those differences and how you account for those differences. That in and of itself is a, is a kind of success story, right? So it's partly about framing the pieces of the story, right? Here's what we tried to do that didn't work, but here's the information Note that I do not use the term data here. Here's the information that we got out of that failure point and what we did with it as we moved to the next point, right? Um, it, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm kind of putting together Rose's feedback with what I heard you describing, Kimberly, in your initial sort of initial story. Thank you, that's really helpful. I guess just like some feedback that I think would be really interesting to learn about more too is that last bullet point you mentioned about the uh, how to decide like what to take out of the guide just because I kind of run into the problem sometimes where I put so much in to something that it's just not helpful because uh, you know there's too much information. Could definitely be one of the hardest parts. Thank you. This is Danny. Um, I I think that you've got something that could really spur on a lot of additional conversations if you just talk about metrics. Um, if you were to talk about what the metrics that you give like three examples and why some failed and why some succeeded, it actually sets other people up for success to copy this in what they're doing. Um, you may actually be able to sustain, you know, something that has gone, it, it like, 
that can be compared to other teams in open source or across your company. And I, I wonder if, if that might actually be a nice way to limit your topic so that you really dig in in your 30 minutes. I'll think about that. Thank you. So limiting to just the metrics and examples. Yeah, to add to what Danny said, I've been waiting for somebody to do a metrics talk and I would really love to see somebody kind of interview the people who participate in the analytics channel on the Slack, the right to doc Slack and kind of get best, best practices and, you know, congeal everything. <laughs> into a talk that could apply to different situations, maybe compare and contrast how different teams have done things. And maybe that's a totally different talk idea, but. <laughs> well, we're starting to get to the point where the conversation is going into awkward silences. So I don't know if anybody else has feedback for Kimberly, but I think I think we're ready to go to uh, proposal number five. And since I find myself liking to see people's faces, I'm not going to screen share since all, all I have is, uh, is Swapnil's name. And I, I know Swapnil's joining us from Australia and I will make him the, uh, the, the host if he has, has uh, slides to share. Actually, I don't have any slides, Mike, okay. but thanks so thanks much. Um, it's pretty early days. Like it's, um, I've literally had this thought this morning, like I was on a chat with my um, manager and another documentation writer, tech writer. So I've started at a new organization a couple of months back, but it's sort of a uh, mix, uh, mixed role. So I'm writing documentation, but I'm also interacting with the community. So it's more like a tech writer relations advocate role. Um, and it's, it's, it's this idea is like literally a seed at this moment. So I don't even know if there's enough, you know, material there. And I'm, I'm hoping to get some, you know, sort of feedback from other people here, whether it can actually develop into a proposal. So to provide a bit of a context, what our product, which is a, it's an API um, documentation product. It does a whole lot of other things, but primarily a lot of this is using people's open APIs and converting them into a, developer portal or reference documentation and it's all sort of tied in together we do linting and everything on the product on open api definition files and um, once that's sort of set up it goes into reference docs and developer portal so everything just sort of sits coupled nicely together this morning i was having a chat with my manager and he said there's a lot of customers that are asking us that they're really impressed with the product that's not an issue it's the the thing is when they start working on the documentation aspect of it so when they start working on the reference docs or the developer portal, the thing that they get stuck with is uh, not necessarily businesses or organizations or developers themselves, but technical writers who could be working at these organizations. What they get really stuck into is um, there is no use, user interface or a content management system that allows them to create the documentation. So, and I, I'll only provide that much context because the idea then germinated from there is a lot of technical writers in the past have worked with some sort of a user interface. So uh, it could be a help authoring tool like Madcap Flare or RoboHelp or something like that, or could be a CMS like Contentful or, you know, even working with customer support or knowledge base software like Zendesk or um, something like that or Intercom. And they, they're sort of used to looking at a user interface and then creating documentation based on it. And then there's the other on the other side of this whole spectrum are the developers or people who are pretty comfortable working with in um, boxes code approach and working with just pure text and then rendering them into documentation. So it's a bit of a, from my sort of experience, there are two types of sort of tech writers, some who are happy with the user interface and they want to work in that sort of specific environment. And then there's, technical writers or people who come, I'm, I'm, I use the word technical writers, but it's anyone who pretty much, you know, does documentation within the organization. They're comfortable working with Markdown or Docs as old approach, and they're pretty happy doing that. So there's these two people and there's some sort of a wall in between from experience where people from the UI 
side of things don't want to jump into Markdown. And once you're into Markdown, you're sort of reluctant using the user interface because you know you can do a lot more things in Markdown and the collaboration with developers sort of just, you know, ramps up um, exponentially. So the talk idea was literally how do, how do technical writers or people who document get over that fear factor of um, working with something like Markdown or Docsets code? I know it's a very basic idea, but is there anything that can come out of that idea in terms of a proposal? Is there like, you know, things that we can educate people who, who haven't worked with Markdown before um, to get over that fear factor? Sometimes I just find technical writers are reluctant because they think, oh, I might be working in Markdown in a repository that the developer is using and I might, broke, I, I might break some product code or something and the whole system crashes. So is there, is there any idea that can, a proposal that can come out of this idea? So um, I, I'd like to jump in because uh, I, I worked at Juniper on a, on a project where I was, um, uh, it was, you know, Swagger to Markdown. We were using Swagger to Markdown. Actually, it was my proposal that got, got them to use Swagger to Markdown um, in order to, uh, anyway, in, in, I, as I got involved in that process, then with the team um, I was working with, many of the people wanted to learn about lightweight markup languages and about, um, uh, you know, so that they could get a little more involved. Uh, working directly with development teams. And um, in addition, um, those of us that had experience with Git started teaching other writers there how to use Git. And so um, we came up with an idea of just enough Git. And if you'd like to collaborate or if you'd just like to, to even just you give the, the talk, I would be happy to to take a little more of the discussion offline and just give you some benefit of the experience that, that I had a, a teaching, you know, I don't have to be the one giving, uh, you know, co-presenting co or anything. I can just give you some information um, that you, you can feel free to take, take part of the story. You don't have to mention Juniper, um, <laughs> but just, you know, I, I just think it's a really powerful idea and I would really like, um, to to help more writers understand it's really not all that hard if mm -hmm. if you take the approach of learning just enough git yep as a start you know it's like let, let's 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 because you don't have to as a writer you don't you know whatever i have a whole lot of points i can make and you probably have some of those already but um you've just really intrigued me and and i'd love to help okay thank you that was Alyssa, wasn't it? Yeah, I'll just make a note. Alyssa Sawyer, yeah, it, I can, uh, I can type my, uh, I, I trust everybody here, so uh, you know, um, here's a, I'll just type my information in, so you have it. Okay, thank you. Um, this is Steliana. I just wanted to provide my feedback. Also, um, I'm actually uh, thinking of presenting a proposal on um, uh, Docs' code building it from scratch because that was my experience with it. Um, I actually work as part of a development team and uh, I can't imagine, you know, doing, using any other strategy to maintain documentation and what you said about, you know, having that divide between technical writers, some that utilized, you know, the Docs code approach and the other side, I like, it, it really resonated with me because I don't ever want to abandon the Docs code approach. Um, I think it's very beneficial being a part of a development team and having those resources um, to directly, you know, go to for information. Um, and actually, technically, I'm a part of the QA team, but overall, I'm a part of the development team. So having those resources when new features come out and I can like test them and um, I have access to all the tools and, and, and they're very they include me in that process. Um, and it's very nice to actually be able to work in that collaborative environment with engineers and to be trusted, you know, to understand that information. So it really, really resonated with me. And I think um, there would be value, you know, to uh, kind of, I don't know, highlight some of those benefits um, to people, I guess. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, I had one thought about people kind of transitioning from one group to the other that uh, I think um, if you're in a WYSIWYG type environment, but you have the ability to toggle to like a source code view, whether yep. it's my bad cat flare or even Dita has some uh, user interfaces that you can then toggle to just see the bare XML. Yep. Like learning how to troubleshoot using those more technical view is a is a good way that's like a gateway <laughs> to becoming more familiar and, and confident in those types of interfaces. I think that's a brilliant point, Rachel. Um, I've never worked in a data authoring tool that didn't require me at some point to troubleshoot the raw XML. <laughs> and if you can do that, you're fine working with much anything in access code, right? Um, so I think when I was listening to you talk, Swapnil, I was thinking, like you posited this as a great divide. There are the users of the WYSIWYG tools and then there, there are the users of the, the code tools. And, you know, like Rachel's idea is, it, what Rachel said is helping me articulate that maybe the, the thing to do is not posit it as a great divide, but talk about the gateway drugs to, you know, like, if you're working with a WYSIWYG tool, chances are that there's more going on that you're interacting with under the superficial WYSIWYG hood um, that maps to DOCSIS code than you might think ahead of time. Um, if you're really like used to a WYSIWYG tool, which I think most technical writers worth their salt really aren't at a certain point. We always have to poke under the hood. We always have to dig a little deeper to understand what's going on, whether it's in the tools that we use or the functionality that we're documenting. And I'm going to stop now because I could keep going forever at this point. Actually, so this is Nicola. I, I will kind of bounce off that, that last comment. Um, so we, I, I was working at a large company for a while. Uh, we were in DITA. And I actually had to help an acquisition move from FrameMaker to Dita because that's what we had funding for. So you can probably guess what company it was. And um, and so we had we had mathematicians, we had business analysts, and we had technical writers all having to learn this stuff. And there were varying degrees of acceptance and varying degrees of acceptance of working in plain text as opposed to um, a WYSIWYG environment. So we actually were using Oxygen and having that flexibility to go between the plain text view and varying degrees of showing tags was really helpful. And then along the lines of just enough Git, like I, I provided education on sort of just enough data. We were pretty lenient on how we had we had the SMEs, you know, write their docs and conform to two types of information. So we allowed we we, we kind of provided some compromise and sort of met them where they needed to be. So we said, you know, what, what do you need? Well, I need to be able to write this stuff. I need to be able to write formulas. So, you know, we investigated tooling, we created templates. Um, I set up Jenkins so that doing builds was really easy and had a graphical front end. So you find ways to kind of bridge that space so that you can meet a range of of needs, because there were some people who were like, I want to write everything in plain text and don't give me an interface. And we had people who said, I want to see that plain text as little as possible. So I had to accommodate the whole range. Sounds like you have a number of perspectives on, on the great divide or finding a way to gateway drugs. I, I, I don't know if swap nil if you, if you need any more, but I, I think we want to get to as many proposers as possible. No, I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for uh, sharing your thoughts, everyone. Thank you. Great. And next up, uh, it's just checking my notes. I believe it's uh, it's R Rachel Stravinsky. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, pretty much. If I do have like a rough outline I could share if you're okay. willing to yep. make me the host for a bit. Yep, uh, let's see. 
find your name. It keeps moving around. Make host. Yes, you should be now be host. Thank you. Okay. So I know it's the, the end of a long day for me. So I have to look at something written in order to actually think clearly right now. Um, so my proposed title is shuffle ball change, sashay your way to clear API documentation. Uh, it's a little bit silly, but I, so I, there's something that happened to me many years ago where I was in a musical theater workshop and there was going to be a master class with Gregory Hines. And I knew this girl who like wasn't a very good tap dancer, but she just like went out there and tapped her little heart out and got into this master class. And then like by the end of the class, like she was tap dancing with Gregory Hines, like no big deal. And I think the takeaway for me was really like, you don't have to have a master's degree in API documentation to add value to a company. And I think a lot of times people get into a place where they're just said, hey, our API docs need help. Or maybe the company doesn't even know that their API docs need help. And so I, I want to sort of uh, take that as, and mostly talk about API reference documentation, but to, to give some context for the different types of documentation um, and then the benefits of being somebody who understands the way that a uh, company's API works so that if you're also working on UI based documentation or even the UI strings in the app, if it's running on the API, understanding the way that that API works helps you write clear UI text as well. Um, so my thought was to, I've worked at a few different places on APIs and I had different ways of, of working to improve the docs at each place I was working. Um, so for example, one, um, they had like a million different microservices, but we had one that was really key and so I had this giant spreadsheet and I worked to uh, refine all of the, the descriptions and just started there. Um, so that's kind of high level. Um, I've also worked where like the writer really owns the API spec and is carefully crafting it while testing in Postman. Um, I've also worked where you're following up on the commits that, that people are putting into the repo and, and just editing code comments. Um, and then most recently, I worked to establish some API guidelines for backend developers who are working on creating the API. So um, I was going to go into the details of basically how I created these guidelines and how we're workshopping them at Netlify to, uh, to help the API documentation move forward. So I was thinking, uh, you know, for documentarians that are feeling shy about delving into API documentation, um, but also people who are currently working in API docs just to kind of compare notes on processes. And so I guess my questions for the group are, is this useful enough information for people to share at a conference? You know, what, um, I feel like it's kind of like, well, duh, to some degree. And, and if it is, that's fine. Um, but I, so that's, that's my basic question, I would say. I just put this in the chat, but absolutely yes. I'm one of the Slack moderators. And every week we have hordes of well, okay, for it is an exaggeration, but it's late my time too, and I have a tendency <laughs> to write poorly. Um, people who are interested in getting started in API docs, and they're like, okay, they know there's this open API spec thing, and they talk in all sorts of different ways about how they interact with it, how they interact with engineers, how the engineers interact with the, with the API, with the spec. Um, and you talk about like a larger context and ways of understanding things. Go for it. Thank you. I, I want to second that also because we're at a point, we have several APIs and the documentation, it's kind of there, but we need to do a much better job. And when you talk about guidelines, where I'm assuming those are guidelines for how to actually document, like for the developers, how to document the APIs. Is that 
Am I understanding? Yes. Okay. Yes. So they have, for example, the current REST API, they are doing code comments next to the code. And so it's guidelines for them to know how to structure those comments and what to include and, and very, very clear guidelines on what for them to do. And then we are act as reviewers to ensure that the guidelines are being followed. Yeah, I would be super interested in this as well. Thank you. So I, I just have a little little thing to add that is sort of one of my, my pet things to mention to managers is that as a writer, as I go in and I edit um, developer comments, uh, you know, for, for the API documentation, um, then the developers themselves see, <laughs> see what I've done. <laughs> and whether they get angry or not, they start improving their writing <laughs> because this pesky writer, you know, correcting something that they've done sometimes irritates them and other people feel like, oh, this helpful writer, you know, really improves something. It doesn't matter which way they're going, one way or another, they, they actually um, improve their, their writing in the process because they're seeing it right in their code. I also want to call out something you said that really, really speaks to me. I've actually been making noise about this in various quarters for lo these many years now, um, which is API review, because if it's hard to document, chances are the solution is not in the documentation, right? Um, so maybe that's a whole nother talk. I seem to be proposing lots of extra talks for people tonight, uh, but I think I there might be some value in pointing that out in this talk too. So no, just, just a thought, a, a thing I'm like really, really seriously into. I just put in a comment, Rachel, in the chat about, you know, this is the kind of information I would have really loved to see when I started writing API docs. So something like, I, I actually raised a question in the write the docs Slack the other day about who actually owns the API spec or the open API definition files. And there was some interesting conversation there. So yeah, definitely comes up. This is a really good, good proposal. Thank you. I feel like there's a lot of information that's out there about the tooling and how to do things technically, but sometimes it's not really about the tooling, it's about the words. About the word that as Swapnil says about the ownership, right? I mean, the, the different ways that you describe sort of managing the words also reflect you know, really different workflows, really different approaches to actually developing the API itself, right? If you're maintaining a spreadsheet, <laughs> what on earth is going on in the code? I don't want to think, right? <laughs> or as a, a, a docs teammate um, said to me at a company that shall remain nameless, um, if this is how they manage docs, I don't like to think about what the code is like. <laughs> So, um, you know, when it comes to API docs, you know, ideally things are pretty tightly coupled and the less coupled they are, the more, obviously the more manual. Um, although again, at a certain point it has to be manual because somebody has to write those description strings. Right. Which is a lot of your point. And again, I could go on forever. So I'm stopping now. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate the insights. I love this, how, uh, how, how a meetup all of a sudden seems to run itself and I don't have to jump in or, 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 or prompt anybody, but it sounds like Rachel has got, has a great proposal and has gotten good feedback on how, how to improve it. Uh, and and uh, we're, we're getting on to uh, proposal number seven. Uh, Falon Darville, I hope I, I pronounced that correctly. Uh, let's see, I don't know that I have have sharing. Falon Darville, yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, Rachel, if you can make Falon the host if she has, has slides or anything like that. Uh, no slides. Okay, then just uh, just yeah. go ahead and, uh, and tell us what you have in mind. Okay, great. Um, so this is 
basically a case study about how I drove a docs culture as a solo technical writer in a team of 70 engineers. So I kind of wanted to talk about what it's like being thrown in the fire and how to cultivate a docs culture when nobody's paying too much attention to docs. So when I started at my current company, we had almost no documentation. And now we have three separate websites that I built and all of the docs that came from that. Um, so I would be talking about basically why some docs are better than none, which is kind of necessary to talk about in a startup environment, uh, how I got people involved in building out dozens of docs over three sites, um, how to become comfortable with unfinished documentation because there's a fixation oftentimes on, well, if we can't, just do it all now why do it at all um, how i've been able to establish partnerships with engineers how i kind of found my place within the org as our only technical writer and it's kind of like um a position that's not always regarded as part of the engineering team and then how i started uh just a tech guild where i could speak more with individual contributors as opposed to always listening to what managers would prefer to see. I think it's very important to democratize documentation. And then finally, um, I've kind of alluded to this, but being part of the engineering team and having highly technical skills myself and how that plays into my relationship with the other engineers. I, I would like to chime in if that's okay. Um, I really love this idea as well because I, I feel the same. I, I am the only technical writer on the team and we didn't have um, any type of documentation solution when I started and I feel like I've struggled with a lot of the same things and I think I would find a lot of value um, in, in this type of uh, presentation, like case study, just to kind of see how you were able to kind of wrangle everybody in, you talk about democratizing, um, you know, everybody kind of, I think it becomes organic if you do a good job, like you eventually start to pull people into the process and everyone starts to cooperate, but sometimes it can get frustrating because it can take a while to get to that point. So I think that would be a really good talk as well. I think it would appeal to a broader audience than folks who are, are soul writers too. Um, plenty of us um, have worked on teams or work on teams with similar or even worse ratios, right? Um, so I just came from a team of about 10 and we um, worked with somewhere in the vicinity of 1500 engineers. So same sorts of problems. I, I, I mean, I think startup land in creating the docs culture is a, a specific issue that you're describing and I don't want to suggest that you back off from that only that the cultivating the culture thing can speak to a bigger audience too it's a it's a both and not an either or also I love the, the getting comfortable with incomplete yeah, that's yes. an important one. <laughs> well, yes, that, I agree. That 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 links back to Alyssa's um, talk about open source documentation, where you've always got to be satisfied with incomplete, with imperfect. Um, what's a style guide even? Um, let alone, I mean, like like technical incompleteness. I. I would wanted to add, it sounded like you were saying you were the first technical writer hire for this organization. Is that right? So they had a previous technical writer, but that technical writer left after like, I think three months and I just took over from there and I've been there for since, you know, since the last one. Um, when I came in though, it was just basically the way I described it, it was uh, just kind of scattered um, like Google Docs and like one API guide. So I've been able to like build on that through trying to motivate people to care about documentation. 
I do think it's a pretty common scenario when somebody gets hired in as either the first technical writer or in your case, the second one after a three month blip. Um, and it's kind of an intimidating landscape. So I think to me, emphasizing that aspect of it is would appeal to me as a talk listener. It's intimidating, yet also there are opportunities to set a standard, if you will. And I think that's something that is attendees love hearing. Hey, you know what? You might be the first, you might be scared, like a deer in headlights, but at the same time, you get to set a baseline standard. Absolutely, yeah. Just want to verbalize uh, the, uh, thought of an on a title a roadmap for a solo documentarian and I say documentarian in in that that's the term we like like to use at, at, at write the docs as we as our audience is only about half technical writers we go go beyond that nevertheless I I think this is a great topic being a solo documentarian that has lessons for that anybody can 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 learn from. Yeah, thank you. Well, I don't know if people are getting tired or have other thoughts for for Fallon or and I know they're um oh okay, go ahead. Um uh, one heads um reminder for to write the docs. Um there Historically, there has been many attendees who identify themselves as quote unquote lone tech writers or lone writer in their organization. So you will have a built in audience. Just want to let you know that one of those people too. <laughs> they call me the one woman wolf pack at my job. So <laughs> it'll be great to meet others. Like, make sure you mention that in your. Uh... In your presentation, he knows. Oh right yeah, now. I love that. <laughs> the one woman wolf pack. That's great. <laughs> I know ninety minutes is about the time when people start getting tired at meetups, but th there are a lot of great pe people here and a lot of great comments. I don't know if Danny was it you, Danny, who wanted to also uh, present uh, an idea or. Oh, or was there anybody else? I, I forget. Yeah, I would love to. Um, if it'll be really fast, um, I just put some basic slides in the chat. Um, if it's okay to to just riff for a minute, uh, go for it. Um, are you okay? Uh, is it Eliza or Alyssa? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no problem. Okay. Great. So uh, my main question here is whether or not this is an appropriate audience. Um, my name is Dee Fair, Danny Fair, and um, I have been an operations lead and had a really difficult time trying to bridge that gap between non-technical and technical um, uh, communications. And so what I wanted to address in a short talk was um, and is this idea of writing to be understood instead of just explaining. So um, talking about neuro inclusion as a core competency and a leadership style as a documentarian. How do you set teams up for success to understand each other um, where we might be uh, just kind of sticking with a, a standard or a consistent way of writing that doesn't actually uh, inform new teams or different types of thinkers. So um, I'm not sure if everyone can see the slide deck. Yes, no? Yes. I can see it fine, yes. Oh, okay. Great. Um, so basically, my uh, TLDR or the um, general purpose here is just that 
you need to have a suite of inclusive writing strategies so that people are oriented around being understood rather than simply explaining. Um, because when we just look at what technical writing or dev teams are doing, they, um, it's not followed by the rest of the organization. And we're seeing in worlds where there are no documentarians, it's not even being, you know, there isn't that um, baseline for, uh, to follow. So uh, the idea of the session would just be to identify some limits in typical writing and communication standards and tinker with a few templates that I have um, and encourage some discussion on this, whether or not they're useful and um, how they might be uh, improved upon. So uh, with that, if we go over to, um, it, it, I, I'll put the link in the chat here um, to get to the tools themselves. That's all right. Um, it is, let's see, neuroinclusion.io. Um, and I just put that in the chat. I realize it can't, it's not actually hyperlinked because of that problem. Can anyone get to that site? I'm there. You are? Okay, yeah. cool. So if you go into the um, drop down on the upper right, you'll see tools. Go ahead and click that. And um, the the main focus I wanted to do is to have people um, actually play around there. Um, I realized since I am not able to share my screen, that was a flaw in my process here. If you will let me share, then I could open it up. Otherwise, um... uh, let's see. I forget who has the, the, the host right now, but if you can give that. I I think I passed it to Falon. Okay. Falon, do you have the host? And I am not the host. Or I think you may have oh. the ability to pass it yeah. along. Okay. Um, if you can choose uh, Danny and click the more link, I think it was. Okay, done. Danny, do you have access? Great. Um, so I can go ahead and share the neuroinclusion site. I'm doing this all from my phone, and so I'm afraid this is causing more problems. Um, so if, let's see. We're able to access the, the link that you shared in the chat. Oh, good, good, good. Okay, great. So um, basically, if you go into um, that, you'll see some of the tools that I've built, and um, it's not really clear if um, this is the appropriate place for, um, again, I am, I'm just gonna undo this because my phone is, is not cooperating. I have an Android and it's not showing me what I need to see. Okay, so um, this is all debugging for when we do this online and we are remote, I think. <laughs> I guess the question I have is how, how can a documentarian or technical writer or whomever actually use uh, uh, lessons from neuroinclusion in, in our work? Well, that's the whole point here. So it's that we have this, uh, we make a lot of assumptions about what is understood based on language, like we've mentioned before in this talk, and um, also on communicating needs for additional resources to executives, also to sales teams that are over-promising, may not necessarily, any sort of outreach 
to developers outside of a company. So when you're looking at how to be as effective as possible, a lot of times people are, they don't have any uh, baseline of understanding outside of your own specific team. And so this is a unique way of looking at how to uh, display information and get some basic understanding of everyone's way of thinking in order to best communicate. So uh, some of the templates that are on there, you'll see there's one that talks about decision making uh, based on to sort of surface unconscious bias. There's another template in that tool um, uh, site that talks about um, uh, worker profiles. So it's this uh, very rudimentary or maybe it's just an overarching topic that addresses this at scale, communicating so that you know what you're saying is being understood and doing it in a way that um, sort of normalizes the differences in folks that might have, be on the autism spectrum, have ADHD, might only be able to really communicate in visual or, or really understand the things they see versus the things they hear. So um, I'm open, I would love to hear your feedback. If you don't think this is the right audience for this, then that's cool. I just wanted to tap into such a, a effective community with Write the Docs and I wasn't sure um, if this was appropriate. Whoops. I have a couple of follow-up questions along Absolutely. The it like intended to help address your question, right? Sure. Um, because just, okay, you know, you know, you know, like I've, I've spent all of a couple of minutes exploring the site. So I don't really have a sense of what the resources are like. But my very quick skim suggests that there are resources that are designed more for more two-way interaction. Yeah. And when you're creating documentation, th this is one of the reasons why documentarians are so obsessed with analytics, right? It's one of the few ways that we have of getting a sense of what reception of our work might be like. Why there's often chatter on the Write the Doc Slack about feedback widgets because, oh my God, you know, if like users are going to like give us feedback, we want that. Um, but it's not the same. And I mean, I would dearly love to see the kinds of issues that the neurodiversity resources are trying to address, like translated into the more, not, not entirely, but more sort of one-way communication that documentation has to struggle with. Um, yeah. I don't know whether you feel like ready to undertake that translation effort. I think it would be really awesome if, if you were, or if you could even just sort of imagine what the possibilities might be like. One of the things that I think a lot of professional documentarians like struggle with is how to write approachable documentation that can reach a global audience. And that feels exactly. like really close, really close, like really, really like this close to the neurodiversity issue, right? Because so much of that is culturally defined. It's not, Absolutely. It's, yeah. it's not inherent, right? It's all about how narrowly, okay, um, another hob, another soapbox. Yeah, no, I think we're right in the same page, we define yeah. normal, right? And sort of how constrained we make our communication because we think it all has to happen one way. Um, so I think that there's just tremendous potential um, here. And, yeah. and, I, and I guess I think it, I'm going to stop. <laughs> Go. No, no, I appreciate that. That makes me feel like I'm not just shooting in the dark here. I think where um, because of the limits and I'm not at home, I'm legitimately parked in a casino parking lot trying to like connect um, here. It, there is a, a matrix I built called the Waldo matrix, which is basically uh, something that um, will explain where you go for what, at what stage are you in this doc, who's allowed to edit, who's allowed to comment, and where it's kept. And it's, uh, if you go into that, uh, the working, the tool worksheet, um, I can send you the link later, but it basically is what I want to propose as something that can be used by any team 
to explain where you go to find our guts, the things that we're doing, and who's allowed to edit and how. Once it's been approved, then no touchy. You know, like it gets moved to another location to avoid this idea of so many drafts that are not um, to be used. And so when I was working at a, a very large, large, upsettingly large company, um, they just had tons and tons of drafts and everyone was editing past drafts and nobody was killing anything. No one was deleting anything. And there was no, like I was able to actually get rid of about 30% of their, um, of the, 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 um, of their SharePoint uh, requirements. So basically that's not big, but it was enough to prove that they had so much redundancy and it was only hurting them because no one had the most clear um, uh, information possible. So being very clear about where things go when they're done and then being able to have that doc hygiene I think is important. Um, so that was the exemplar I was gonna walk people through to see if it's of any use. So I would, um... I would emphasize that example in the abstract because okay, okay. now we're starting to talk about internal documentation processes. And that's something that's really core to all communities, whether or not it's open source of yeah. how do you create and streamline and control, you know, the information inside of your, um, your company and it is a type of documentation and I almost want to call it control out delete because you're trying to mm -hmm. control and you are removing the alternative options for drafts and you're deleting you know what doesn't serve you I like it I like it a lot um, and I think that uh, that gives me something to go home and and edit um, and if I just focus on the Waldo matrix or this thing that I created I think that that will allow people to see that you do not need to, it's, it's really platform agnostic. Um, so people do not, I, I love it, I love it. That's great um, for the subject on the chat. Um, so, okay, cool, that sounds good. I'll, I'll iterate and um, hopefully have something that uh, stands uh, the sniff test. Sweet. Sounds wonderful. Uh, we've had a okay. lot of, uh, Andy, it sounds like you have direction. Mm -hmm. uh, I do, I do. I gotta run because I'm, I'm still in the parking lot. So thank <laughs> you all very much. See you, Danny. Bye, bye.